We're reading from Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 17. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell richly among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs through the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father, thanks so much that you are such a great heavenly dad, that you love us, that you're so good to us, that you didn't hold your one and only son, that he died on that cross, that we might know you, that we might call you our heavenly father. And so, Father, we want to thank you so much for that. Amen. Well, I've never taken illegal drugs before, but I reckon there was a time a couple of years back where I came really close. Um, What a great way to start a sermon, right? I was going on a bike ride with a guy that I worked with, and so I arrived at his house in Wimalee, and I rock up with my bike. I jump out, I got uh, my helmet, I've got my lights, I'm ready to go, and I walk up to this guy's front door, and he hands me a 700 ml drink bottle. And so I take that drink bottle and I start drinking it. I've finished this whole drink bottle even before we get on the bike. And at the time, I didn't realize that in this drink bottle, there was two scoops of a pre-workout called Hemorrhage. And this Hemorrhage, basically, it, it plays with your body so that you can lift heavier weights for bigger gains when you go to the gym. And it also messes with your mind. So you look at the dumbbells there and you think, of course I can lift that. Of course I can do anything. This stuff is so bad that it's since been banned in Australia. (laughs) And it actually contains similar substance to what you might take if you're partying in the city. And so there we are. We're riding 10 kilometers into the ride. We're in the Glenbrook National Park. It's nighttime, so our lights are on. I'm on the bike. We're going down a single track. And I'm riding along. I'm pedaling, doing my thing. And then all of a sudden, I start to feel strange in my head. I start to feel like I'm there, but I'm not there. It's like I'm floating. I know that I'm riding down this track. I'm holding on. I'm pedaling, but I'm so distracted by everything around. Wow, there's stars, the trees. And I got a flat tire. I dump my bike and my mate, it starts changing. I go over and I'm going to the trees and, oh, did you know that leaves are green? And, oh, wow, there's so many rocks in the bush. I was so out of it. The last thing that I was thinking about was the track ahead. This isn't about drugs. Please don't do drugs. (laughs) I ended up throwing up over 10 times in the bush 10 minutes later. But friends, I tell you this story because I wonder if that's how we go through life. 
We go through life so distracted by this world around us that we never ask the big questions. Or as Christians, we go through life and we're so distracted by this world. We live for this world and we take our focus off Jesus. Well, here in Colossians chapter 3, Paul focuses back on Jesus. And here at MBM, we are all about seeing lives transformed through Jesus to the glory of God. And Colossians 3 is exactly that passage. And so let's have a look there. It starts all with Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And so Paul gets straight into it. And let's join him. Let's jump straight into this passage. You see, when you come to Jesus, when you have said yes to Jesus, you are so connected with him. You are in Jesus. And so Jesus, he was raised back from the dead. He was raised to new life. And so in Jesus, you too are raised to new life. Remember the dodgy teachers here in Colossians. They're saying to the believers, there's something better out there than Jesus. They're saying there's a better experience out there. But Paul is saying, no way. Jesus is the greatest. Jesus is the absolute best because in him you have absolutely everything and you are living the new raised life. Jesus died and he was buried three days in a tomb. There's no coming back from that. But the Spirit of God, it breathed new breath into Jesus. And he appeared to 500 people. And that same Spirit that raised Jesus, raised him to the greatest position of power, the right hand of God. And that same Spirit gives life, new life to those who say yes to Jesus. Remember coming to Jesus, union with him. It's like getting on a plane. And so you get on that plane, you sit in that plane, and everything that that plane does while you're in there, you do too. So when that plane takes off, you take off. When that plane goes through turbulence and through the clouds, you do too. And then when that plane lands in the final destination, you do too. And so it is with Jesus. It's like everything that Jesus does, we do it with him. Everything that Jesus has, he gives to us. Everything that Jesus inherits, we inherit. Jesus is brought back to life and taken into heaven. And so we are brought back to life spiritually right here, right now. And spiritually, we are seated in the heavens with Jesus. You see, we need so badly this new life of Jesus because all of us have experienced and have come so close to death, physical death. But even more than that, because of our rebellion against God, we are spiritually dead. We are separated from Jesus. And so if you haven't said yes to Jesus, we're so glad that you're with us tonight. And we would love for you to be in heaven with us. And so our hope and prayer is that this Father's Day, you would come to Jesus and you would say yes to him because he offers life now and for all of eternity. In Jesus, we are new. We are living this new life and we live out this reality here and now. And Colossians shows us how to do that. Have a look at the end of verse 1 into verse 2. Paul writes, Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Now, isn't this so hard? Because I look deep into my heart and I see what I long for. I see what I desire. I look into my mind and I know what I think about in secret. But really, when you think about the things that this world offers, those desires and those thoughts, do they really, really satisfy? Do they really, really bring joy? No, but Jesus, Jesus does. We have this new life in Jesus. We have satisfaction. We have meaning. We have purpose. We have joy in Jesus. And what does that mean to set your heart and mind on him? Well, everything is about Jesus. Everything that we think about is in reference to Jesus. When we think about singleness, when we think about dating, when we think about school, when we think about study, when we think about work, we do it all in the reference of Jesus. Because we have this new life and this new reality in him. I think about my Saturday mornings, I get up early and I'm heading off to work 
I'm tired, I wish I was still in bed. And as I'm walking through Parramatta, I cross over Wild Avenue. And that is my cue to pray, to pray that God would help me to set my heart and minds on things above as I work for that day. Friends, what is your morning cue? What is your cue that will prompt you to think about Jesus and to live for him, to pray that he would help you to do that? We are, have new life. We are raised in Jesus. And what Paul says next seems so strange. He says that we've died with Jesus. Have a look at verse 3 again. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And that seems so strange, dying, because we've just been talking about being raised to new life. And this is such a hard part of the Christian life to understand. What does it mean that we died? Well, remember being in Jesus. Remember union with him, being connected with him. Well, as Jesus died on that cross, you too died on that cross. As Jesus died on the cross, he paid for your sin. He freed you from the slavery of sin. Your sin died on that cross and was paid for by Jesus. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 says, He, Jesus, forgave us all our sins. And they stood against us and condemned us, but Jesus, he has taken them away. He has nailed them on the cross. He has crushed them. Our sin has been crushed on the cross. And that sin that was a ball and chain strapped onto our ankle that followed us absolutely everywhere, that has been cut off and paid for on the cross. Have you ever tried your living a day where you do nothing wrong? It's absolutely impossible, right? Sin is our knee-jerk reaction. Sin is our default. It's where we go. And there's nothing that we can do on our own to get rid of it. I've got so many stories of growing up and going to the hardware store with my dad, watching my dad use a hammer, watching him saw, watching my dad fix stuff around the home, watching my dad work on and fix cars, watching my dad fix the dial-up internet. I've got so many memories. <laughs> Shows my age. I've got so many memories of my dad fixing stuff. To me, my dad could fix anything and he could fix everything. But no one can fix the problem of sin. Only Jesus can. And so we need to come to him. We need to kneel at the foot of the cross, having our sin fully paid for. We need to have that burden of sin lifted from our shoulders, knowing that Jesus fully paid for sin. And sin is no longer our ruler. Sin is no longer our master. And so this week, when we come to a fork in the road, a decision or an action, one way where we follow Jesus and one way where we sin, sin no longer changes. us. We can say no to sin. We have the Spirit of God living inside of us, enabling us to say no to sin and yes to Jesus. But also know, as we heard about in this interview, that when we mess up, we come back to the foot of the cross. We know that Jesus has paid for sins in the past, in the present, and in the future. Sin has been paid for on the cross. We died so we can say no to sin. Have a look at the next part of verse 3. Paul writes, your life is now hidden with Jesus in God. Then have a look at verse 4 to see what he means. When Jesus, who is your life, appears, then you'll appear with him in glory. You see, we have this new life with Jesus, but we're not fully living out this life. It's like we have one foot on this, in this world and one foot in heaven. We participate now in Jesus, but not fully yet. It's like if you go to a motor car show and you go, everyone's waiting to see this new, brand new model of car and it's sitting up on the stage. You can see the shape of the car, but it's partly hidden under a blanket. And everyone's waiting for that blanket to be pulled off so you can see that car in full. Well, it's just like us and Jesus. We're seeing partly now. We're experiencing it partly, but it will be fully revealed. It will be fully shown when Jesus returns and takes us to be with him. Takes us to the place where there's no crying, no mourning, no pain, no suffering, and no death. Who we are will be fully revealed when Jesus returns. And so as we live with our foot in this world, we're a restoration, a car restoration, we're a home renovation, with our hearts and minds set on Jesus. And the next part of 
chapter 3, verse 5 shows us what this life looks like. Have a look down there, verse 5. Put to death. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. The language here is so strong, and this is the one time in the New Testament where we're permitted to pick up the sword and put something to death. The one time where we're permitted to be violent. Take to sin with the sword. This shows how serious sin is. Remember the words of Jesus. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Sin is a big problem, and Paul and Jesus take this so serious. Don't let our bodies have any part in our sinful nature. You see, sin loves to live in the dark because in the dark is where sin grows, where sin breeds. But when you bring sin out into the light, when you come to the cross of Jesus, that is how we put sin to death, when we confess it, when we bring it out into the light. And so let's take the sin with the sword. Let's have absolutely no part. God's word says, put to death sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't use your body to take the good gift of sex that God has made and use it out of the context of marriage. Whether it's sleeping with someone that we're not married to, whether it's looking at things on our smartphones or the internet, whether it's reading fantasy books, put that to death. Slay it with a sword. Set your heart and mind on things above where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Aren't we so thankful for those men that have signed up for that course to put, uh, to put the sin of porn to death? They are taking putting to death seriously. And keep going with that sword. Have a look at the end of verse 5. Paul says, put to death greed. And greed is buying to this lie that the more stuff that you have, that will satisfy you. Greed is saying it's all about me. It's all about what I can get. Buying into that story that the person with the most stuff is the one who wins. It's constantly looking at that next upgrade. And I think of myself and my own four-wheel drive. I think about my car. It gets me from A to B, does all that I need it to do. But I'm always on Facebook Marketplace looking at that next upgrade. It's a Jeep after all. Thanks, Steve. But greed is never being satisfied with what God has given. It's always wanting more. And picture Adam and Eve in the garden. God created them good. They had everything that they need, yet they wanted more. And so they took the fruit from the tree and they ate and look where that got them. Take to greed with the sword. Put it to death. Have a look at the seriousness of this in verse 6. Paul writes, because of these, that is sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life that you once lived. You see, God hates it when people take his good gifts and trample all over them. God hates it when people take good things and use them for sin. And one day, God is going to put all of this right. God is going to put sin right. God is love, but God is also just. And that is such a good thing because sin and evil will be punished. So friends, dig deep into your heart. Dig deep into your heart. What is it that you desire? What is it that you long for? What is it that you're trying to feel? Acceptance, loneliness, recognition, attention from others. You see, the misuse of sex, the misuse of impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, they promise so much. But in the end, they, they fail us. They leave us wanting more. They never, ever satisfy And Colossians says, that's the old life that you're done with. That's the life that you lived before Jesus. Put it to death. In Jesus, you are new. And friends, remember that Jesus is our Lord. He gives us commands. But remember that Jesus is our Savior. He has saved us and He wants what's best for us. He wants us to flourish and grow as His people. And how do we do that? 
where we obey him, we listen to these commands here in his, in his word. You see, the Christian life, it's not an easy life, but it's a life where we battle with sin, a life where we live for Jesus. And Paul changed his analogy. Have a look there at verse 8. He goes on to talk about putting off old clothes. Verse 8, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices. It's like the picture of a week of going camping. You go camping for a week and you're wearing your clothes, you get dirt all over them, you get sand in your pockets, you get charcoal on the sleeves, you wear the same undies for the whole week, right? It's, you turn them inside out halfway through, it's all good. But your clothes get so dirty and then you come back from camping and what do you do? You take those off. You don't wear those clothes to work the next day. And that's the image that Paul is saying. He's saying, you are new, you are in Christ. Have nothing to do with the sinful nature. Take it off. Take it off. They are the old way before Jesus. It makes me so angry that people won't do it my way. This person said they'd help out, but they didn't. They're absolutely hopeless. My time is so tight. Can you hurry up and get this job done? Friends, take off the old clothes. Get rid of anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy languages. I love it. In one of our leadership courses here at MBM, we rate ourselves on how we go at these. We rate what we think, and then we rate what someone who's really close to us, what they would think. And I wonder if you did that for your life. What would the gap be between what you think of yourself and what someone who knows of you thinks? And what about the gap between how someone else would rate you and what you know in your mind? Here at MBM, we have this value that we don't do pretend. We don't do pretend when it comes to sin. And so MBM, it's time to get real with yourself. It's time to get real with each other. And most importantly, it's time to get real with Jesus. Because if we don't put sin to death, if we don't crush sin in our lives, it is going to crush and put us to death. It's going to choke our faith. So come to Jesus today. Repent. Whatever that sin is, lay it at the foot of the cross. Jesus died to pay for that sin. And the amazing thing is, is that we don't battle with sin on our own. Have a look at verse 10. Verse 10, you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. It's so great that as we live this life changing, Jesus never leaves us. He is with us each step of the way. The Holy Spirit is working in us and changing us. God is working to make us more like Jesus. So we respond with obedience and God changes us and makes us more like him. And we're not defined by this world, but we're defined fully and primarily by Jesus. Have a look at verse 11. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. And so Paul, he isn't disregarding our different cultures. He's not disregarding our different genders or our roles or whatever it might be. We love here at MBM that we have a range of cultures, but what Paul is saying is that primarily, First and foremost, who you are and your identity, it is not defined by this world, but it is defined by Jesus, your Savior and your Lord. You are new. You have this new life. This is now who you are. And so put on the new clothes. Have a look at verse 10. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Isn't this the picture of a church that shows off what God is like by living for him? A church that puts a smile on the face of God. And of course, we look to Jesus who has our model. Think of his compassion, his gentleness, his humility, the way he went out of his way to help the outcast and the outsider. He was so kind. 
Jesus, the King of the universe, absolutely humble. He died on a cross for us. He thought of others. He put others first. He's so gentle and patient with sinners like you and me who keep on messing up. Compassionate, kind, humble, gentle. What score would you give to yourself? Jesus is our model. We are living this new life in him. Have a look at verses 13 and 14. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Church relationships are so hard. And this is a reality check because churches are full of sinful people. And so the reality is in churches, we are going to be hurt by other people. And the temptation for us is to withdraw. The temptation is to ignore those people. The temptation is to bottle up frustration or complain about those people behind their back. But no, 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 we bear with one another. As God's family, we forgive one another. And we look to the place of cross, the greatest forgiveness that has ever been shown in this universe. Have a look at verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Friends, we don't bring our weapons. We don't bring our guns to church. We don't think about war and division as God's people, but rather we raise the flag of peace and we look to the cross where the greatest flag of peace was raised. We live at peace with one another and we let the story of Jesus' peace be our story. We let that story fill and change us and transform the way that we think and what we desire. So let this story of Jesus and his peace be your story. And have a look. Notice how this chapter goes in full circle back to where we began. Have a look at verses 16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Notice that first part, let the message of Christ, the story of Jesus. That is the story that we want to tell ourselves every day when we wake up. That is the story we want to tell ourselves when we walk through those doors at church. That's the story that we want to tell to those sitting next to us, to those sitting on the table opposite us over dinner. Because that story is the story that leads to a life lived for God. A life that is pleasing to him, a life that puts a smile on his face. And have a look at verse 17. We'll finish here. Verse 17, this really shows what this whole section is about. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Every time you go to open your mouth, stop and think, is this word for Jesus? Every time you go to do an action, stop and think, is this action for Jesus? Because everything we do in the Christian life, everything we do as a church is for Jesus, and we do it in his name. I'll never forget, Francis Chan does this illustration. And I've got this piece of rope which fits with our adventure theme for Father's Day. And I'm going to unwind this rope, and I want you to imagine that this rope keeps on going. I want you to imagine that this rope goes beyond Rudy Hill, that there's a knot, that this rope keeps on going beyond New South Wales, that this rope keeps on going beyond Australia, that this rope keeps on going forever and ever. And then I want you to imagine your life. You might live for 60, 70 years. You might live for 80 or 90 years. This is your life. And some people, they live their whole life for this. They spend their whole life investing in the things of their mind and the things of their heart, sex, relationships, popularity. They live for this. They save so much. They can enjoy this tiny bit. They live and focus on this and they forget about all of this. Friends, in Jesus, you are raised to a new life and you live with this reality. You live here and now focusing and investing and living for this. 
And so if you haven't come to Jesus tonight, if you haven't come to Jesus, come back to him tonight. Kneel at the foot of the cross. And if there's an error in your life, a sin that you want to bring out into light, that you want to put to death, then pray this prayer with me. Speak to someone tonight. Put sin to death. Take to it with the sword. You are new. You are raised in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you're so good to us. You only have one son to give and you fully gave him for us. Jesus, thank you that you died on that cross. And so Jesus, we want to come to you today. We want to be real with you and we want to say sorry, asking for forgiveness. Please forgive us and please help us to live for you. Amen.